Beginning in 1964 with the passage of the Federal Civil Rights Act, the resistance movement in Mansfield cooled off when school officials found out it threatened their federal funding. But in nearby urban Dallas, where more than half of the students were Anglo, local control was more important than federal dollars. As a result, the big city's old guard business leaders and school board members continued their flagrant resistance to federal desegregation court orders. I think it's difficult to believe that the business community could be so uh, uh, blind to this for so long. And I said, some of these people are going to have to die before we make any progress, you know. The attitude was, it's the law of the land except for us. My thinking was, if they could get to go to school with the white children, you know, they'd have the material that they need. A desegregation lawsuit filed in October 1970 by Dallas Legal Services on behalf of black and Hispanic parents would finally be the impetus for change. What happened during the 10 years that followed left an indelible mark on the Dallas School District and the politics of the city. We will tell various stories of this defining decade through vintage film from the KERA archives and interviews with some of the individuals who played pivotal roles. Taylor and Tasby, two families at the heart of Dallas's struggle with desegregation. Concerned about his son's education, Sam Tasby challenged the school district with a lawsuit. The case landed in federal judge Mac Taylor's court. The judge's daughters, Molly and Margaret Ann, watched their father anguish as he struggled for consensus. Why couldn't we have a school when we know, when, when those that are in authority know we need school? When Sam and Georgia Tasby's kids were growing up in this neighborhood, they had to ride a city bus to get to the nearest all-black school. That's because the school district would not let them attend a nearby school because it was for whites. A frustrated Sam Tasby eventually asked for a school to be built in his all-black neighborhood. He was told there was no money. Tasby then took another approach. My thinking was if they could get to go to school with the white children, that have the material that they need. <laughs> With the help of Dallas Legal Services, Sam Tasby filed a lawsuit in federal court. His 16-year-old son, Eddie, was the named plaintiff. It was the quality of education in the black schools versus the white schools. Sylvia Demarest was one of the attorneys handling the case. And it came down even to the fact that in many black schools, the textbooks that they were using were textbooks that were discarded from white schools. Uh, and um, teacher resources, uh, library resources, the quality of the infrastructure itself, the buildings, uh, all of these things on balance to us made it appear that it was not only separate, but it was not equal. Nothing must hurt the business climate. Susan Caudill was a journalist working for KERA in the early and mid-70s as desegregation consumed the city's attention. When the fate of the docket landed this case in Mac Taylor's lap, he decided he was one federal judge who wouldn't ram a desegregation order down the community's throat. Not just because he's part of the community, but because a plan wouldn't work without the support of the community and its leaders. They used to say at the courthouse that he always drew the black bean because he did so many controversial cases. I think he enjoyed being in that controversy. That was part of his service. He insisted for years in vain that desegregation was an opportunity to bolster a faltering school system, an opportunity for Dallas to have the best public schools in the nation. Well, I happened to be home as an adult when the uh, trial began, the hearings began, and every day my father would come home with grocery bags full of hate mail from entire elementary schools saying, don't change our schools, we hate you, we hope you die. This is the scrapbook that uh, my uncle's secretary and court reporter made during his career. Desegregation case test judges metal. He had this wonderful attitude that his goal was justice and fairness. And justice and fairness for the school children, 
But you can't have justice and fairness, he felt, without the community supporting it and participating because then your children would be torn, your community would be torn, and it would just be another ugly scene at a school. These were terribly complicated issues. We did not want to be, um, you know, social scientists. You know, what we wanted to do was to help our clients. They just wanted a better deal for their children. We have to remember what the atmosphere was in Dallas in the early 70s. The attitude was, we don't have to do this, and we can delay this and delay this and delay this. So I think Mac, when he got this case, felt that his responsibility was going to be, we can't delay it, how can we do it and not have violence in the community? I think we have forgotten that until all of this furor really started over desegregation, we never in this country, in America, had considered educating everybody. If you are in Dallas, as Sam Tasby and Judge Taylor both found out, you must first have the support of the business community, and secondly, the school board, and in that order. The school board was actually saying, sort of behind the scenes, that they never wanted a plan that would work. While Judge Taylor was regularly frustrated with a resistant school board and a belligerent business community, he, unlike Sam Tasby, did not have to worry about keeping his job. It wasn't too long when they found out who I was that they didn't need me. So, but uh, I kept going on to the next job, you know. He kept pushing, so I just supported him, you know, but I still wanted him to stop. There were times when Georgia Tasby was afraid, and it was no different for most other folks. There was a lot of fear on the part of the children, on the part of the parents, uh, I think on the part of the business community, I certainly think on the part of the school board and the city council, that Dallas was going to just explode and burn to the ground. Judge Taylor's challenge was to be true to his conscience in a city that virtually ignored a Supreme Court order for nearly two decades. Is the school any better? That's what I'm, you know, is things any better? And it was before it started. I had to do it all over again. I tried again.